The Badger football team returns home to host Illinois on Saturday at Camp Randall Stadium at 11 a.m. Game will be televised by ESPN2. Head coach Gary Anderson is here. We'll have some opening comments, then take questions. Okay. Uh, I want to just talk real briefly about the, the last game and then move on. A uh, lot's been talked about with the quarterback position. I just want to bring some things to the uh, forefront here, for my opinion, as I look at it and understand that, yeah, we threw four picks. Um, but I think those kids, everybody needs to understand that uh, this is an offense. It's not an individual game. And sometimes I think kids get uh, put into a spot to it's all them. It's all their problem. So the pick goes into one stat box underneath one name. I understand that. But I was going to share you the facts of the deal. On the four picks, uh, one of them, the quarterback was hit, and it was a contested ball that could have gone either way, um, which Northwestern got. The other one was a tip ball. There was another one that was a contested ball. And the other one was you know, a decision that you know, we'd all like to have back, but we can still look at ourselves in the eye and say, uh, we're all responsible for every one of those picks. So, you know, that's uh, that's me as a coach, and I believe in both of our quarterbacks. I'm excited to see them continue to grow and develop, and we're looking forward to getting better on the offensive side of the ball. And uh, that is that, and that's really all there is to say. So, um, I'll move on. Um, but uh, would like to point out Melvin, unbelievable game again, and um, I'm sure there's more to come. Excited about the level of play that uh, where he is and the situations that he's putting us in to be able to have an opportunity to win games. And then the last thing on the defensive side <clears throat> from the Northwestern game, you know, our defense uh, was just okay in that game. And if we sit back and we look at it again from a team aspect, and we all look at ourselves, and I look at myself first in all these situations, the fact of the matter is, is you know, we allowed the. Uh, Northwestern to run the ball effectively on us, and they did run the ball effectively on us, which in turn flipped field position. And there was four starting drives that were very difficult for the offense, and the defense had a lot to do with that, the starting point. And um, we had an opportunity to make two special plays on fourth down. We didn't make them. Um, and or I guess one was on fourth down, the other one was on third down there at the end of the game where they completed the power pass in the flat. So uh, again, it's a team game, it's a team effort. I look at myself first, but there is no individuals that cost us the football game. <clears throat> Jeff? Gary, you were asked, <coughs> excuse me, after, <coughs> excuse you me, got after the, the game. I got. <laughs> you were asked after the game about Moving forward with the quarterback situation, yeah. how are you going to handle that this week, whether it's in incorporating both of them, one of them, and how do you sit down with Andy and decide that this week? Yeah, uh, Andy and I have discussed it, and, and Andy's discussed it and communicated with the court, with the uh, quarterbacks also. And um, we're going to play them both. And it'll be, you know, they could possibly both be on the field at the same time. Um, I'm hoping that happens because I think that opens up a little can of worms for people to wonder what's going to happen. So we'll see if that can take place for a couple of plays. Um, and then we'll also play them in different situations. And I, again, I, I'm a firm believer right now that our offense with where we are as an offense as a whole, not as the quarterback position, we're best served to be able to play both of those quarterbacks to help our offense move down the field, um, to help Joel when he's in there at quarterback, to help Tanner when he's in there at quarterback. Both of them playing will help the functionality of the offense and in turn help them be better quarterbacks. <clears throat> Eric. Obviously, uh, one guy can only handle so much of a workload. But when, when there's a one-score game like that, and, the, and you get to watch it over again, do you ever think to yourself, man, maybe we should give Melvin the ball even more? I mean, as crazy as that seems because he does touch the ball so much? Uh, I thought Melvin's carries the last two weeks have been very, very good. And he's had an opportunity to make a ton of big-time plays for us. You know, we, uh, we got the ball. He made a great run. We got the ball on the two-yard line. and. Obviously, that one was called back, and then we get ourselves backed up, and that was a that was a huge situation. Uh, you know, you sit there and you you're going to go back, and anyone would sit back and say, "Oh, would we like to have called a run down there on the two yard line?" I mean, that that's simple to say, and and it's uh, easy to say on after the game. But if it was a completed pass, it would have been great, uh, but it wasn't, and and so we look at ourselves and say, you know, coulda, woulda, shoulda, but. Uh, Melvin has a nice workload right now, and I think he's handling it well. Jeff? Gary, this is in the hindsight department. Mm -hmm. Has where things stand today and where you are moving forward, has, has it forced you to revisit 
your the original decision in camp on how to proceed with the offense at, at the quarterback position? No, no, because there's the key thing for that is, you know, there's so much that goes into that that, in 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 my own opinion. Um, and where we were and what took place and the whole scenario that was there that I, uh, uh, no, I do not. Because it was, again, there's, there's a lot more to it than just the, the public's eye or I guess the people that uh, weren't in the middle of the uh, two-a-day camp with, uh, with the coaches. Terry, we've, we've all seen some of the nice things you've done with the option and the running mm -hmm. part of the quarterback game. Um, regarding Tanner, if you had maybe committed even more to that or commit more to that in the future, does that make him a more effective player, do you think? After the amount of games that Tanner's played and where he sits, um, yes, I would agree with that statement. You know, his, his ability to, to throw on the run, his ability to get outside of the pocket and move around, um, and that's – you know the direction that we potentially can move. I hope as we as we go forward is to play within the strengths of Joel, play within the strength of Tanner, and then quite frankly, if one of them turns around and runs away with it and is more productive, then that's the direction that you go um, as the offense goes. But uh, uh, there needs to be more opportunities to function on the skill sets of of the players on the offensive side, and quite frankly, sometimes on the defensive side too. Is is that going to be hard? to have an offense with maybe a split personality like that? If obviously, the two quarterbacks are different. Yeah, because right now, I don't think you'll see any type of a split personality just because of the fact that the familiarities are there for us. We're not going to all of a sudden come out and be a, <clears throat> you know, a, a pistol team on with one guy sitting in there and then turn around and be a, uh, our normal offense that we are um, as we sit today. So uh, you'll have a flavor. Tanner can run our offense, and he can also give us the flavor of some of the option stuff that he's done, which is great. Um, without adding new plays right now, you know, just move the pocket a little bit more, do some different things for him. Those are plays that are already in the repertoire. And uh, Joel, on the flip side of things, can get that ball down the field like we hope he can. He showed he, he two very, very, very nice balls um, that were uh, thrown in the last game. And his ability to take the top off the coverage and his ability to be involved uh, in the throw game, um, I believe, will be a huge positive. And he can run our offense that we've you know had down the line. So I think we're in a good spot. Jim. Gary, did you see enough of Tanner last year as a, a wide receiver to get a solid evaluation? And if given where you are at that position, if you're only going to use him as, as a, on a part-time basis at quarterback, can he help you at all there? Yeah, that's uh, also you know some, some things to sit back and discuss and you know, the knowledge base and the ability for him to get out there. Um, there's, there's a learning curve again, um, but you would, you know, it's, it's a possibility. Let me put it that way. Rob, you mentioned after the game that one of Joel's better passes was uh, when he checked on the flat to, to mm -hmm. Corey. Um, and that, at times, it seemed to be uh, hit or miss is whether the quarterbacks may be able to do that. Is that a learned skill? Is that something you can still teach them at this point? Or do they have to have that ability to be able to know to check it down to get to their progression that quickly? Uh, you know what? I, I don't know if I could really answer that from a professional standpoint. And I don't want to sit here in front of you and make stuff up that I know how to coach a quarterback. Uh, I'm sure reps help that, learn behaviors as far as where they are within the offense and you know how they feel and um, the overall knowledge. Because I, I couldn't even tell you what the name of that play is. I have no idea. Um, but I think that you know Joel's comfort zone to get through the checks in the offense is is uh, you know pretty good at times, and uh, I think Tanner's shown that in games too. Tom, Gary, have you been walking a fine line with your wide receivers in terms of having veterans who know what they're doing and maybe young guys who are possibly bigger, better, big play threats down the field? And how do you resolve that? And how do, where do you go with that? You know, Coach Beatty and Coach Ludd are, are talking long and hard about that. Uh, we had some discussions this morning just uh, talking about where we sit, how we try to move kids forward without um, hurting the team. And, and again, I go back, it, it is a complex offense, uh, but these kids should be in a spot to where they know the offense now and they should be able to get out there and, and be involved. Um, it, it, it's getting better, you know, and I said it a week ago, you got to get it. You got to show it in practice to get on the field, uh, and that is improving. And so, our ability to get those kids in those moments um, is hopefully those moments on Saturday, I should say, is hopefully uh, you know close to happening. Mm -hmm. and I like them.
Jeff. Along those lines of the, the wide receivers, you, you've mentioned and Chris has mentioned about the contested balls. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can do in practice if a kid just doesn't have that in him at this point in his development to say you've got to go up there and rip the ball out of the other guy's hands and not just let him take it and, and protect your quarterback? Yeah, and I'm a, you know, contested balls are, are definitely part of the uh, of the game, and it's it's difficult. To, it's kind of like I guess a corner. From speaking from my area and where I grew up as a defensive player, there's corners that just feel very comfortable in that last six inches when the ball's coming down on a fade route, and I don't panic because I see the receiver's hands go in the air. I feel comfortable. I just keep moving smoothly down the field. I get my hand up there and hopefully knock it out most of the time in man coverage because it's not a it's not an interception defense um, for the most part. I think receivers are like that too. There's just a calmness that comes over them when they get into a position to. Uh, be involved in the contested ball. So uh, much like a, a great pass rusher, um, you know, they're born. I think great contested ball catchers are born. Can you do things to help them in practice? Absolutely. Um, and we do. Chris does a great job of teaching these wide receivers the skill sets that uh, they need to be able to be prepared, but they just got to get up there and make it. Um, practice helps, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not the answer to making them be great contested ball catchers. Jim, I'm back. In addition to the uh, young wide receivers and, and as you sort out the offense, one thing is you, you haven't seemed to have somebody come out of the backfield, whether it's individual or combined, the role that James White had last year as a pass catcher. Have the opportunities not just been there this year for that? Well, we've missed some. Uh, you know, the screen game has uh, been not great for us. Uh, I think the, the swings to Melvin – and the swings to Corey are, are in the game plan uh, weekly. Our ability to be consistent in getting those, you know, those dump off throws and those throws to him have not been um, as good. The checkdowns, which we hit a few of those, we hit one for a touchdown a couple weeks ago to, to Corey. Um, I believe Bart threw that one, if I remember right. Uh, but, you know, well, it, it's part of our offense, it's there. Um, but I do agree with your statement that the involvement of the backs in the throw game. Uh, will open things up a little bit for us as we move forward, I hope. Andy? Gary, it seemed as you were moving through the season that you were adding plays that had Melvin and Corey on the field at the same time. Northwesterners seemed to be a, a lesser amount of those plays. Is there Was there a, a reason for that? I would probably say just the run game was very successful. You know, that was not our nemesis, and our, our base core runs were successful in that game. And because of that and the way Melvin was running, we wanted to, to keep him in there with the, with the speller of Corey coming in when Corey needed to be able to spell him. So uh, probably quite honestly, I'm sure they were there within the call sheet of Andy's. I don't study Andy's call sheet. Like I said, I don't know Andy's call sheet, but I'm sure those plays were there. Andy didn't feel like he obviously needed to go to those um, in the running situations to um, you know, win the game. That, the, the running game had no effect on us not winning. Gary, I know you're not, you're not a Twitter guy anymore, yeah. but uh, <laughs> you don't uh, uh, have, you know, you probably know that Bart Houston's become the fan favorite, so mm -hmm. to speak as a second or third stringer often is. Um, do you, uh, you know, given how highly he was recruited, is there some reason he has not been able to become a factor in this mix? Um, you know, just with, with I would just say that uh, with Bart, when he's had the opportunity and he comes in, he competes hard, he works his, he works his tail off, and Bart's a good quarterback. Uh, you know, I think our other guys have done some pretty good things too at times, and uh, you know, that, that's a hard one for me to explain other than the fact that as a coaching staff, we sat down and, and made a decision that uh, those were the guys that we were going to go with. And Bart uh, was obviously a, a big part of it. Um, evaluate practice, review practice, and it was, you know, Tanner and Joel and then Bart. Rob? Because the conference season is so young, obviously just played one game, what's the approach with the team mentally this week? Because they're just, as you mentioned after the game, just 0-1-1. And I think the last couple of times the team started 0-1 in the Big Ten, they've gone on to win the conference title. Mm -hmm. How do you approach that with the team this week? Well, a year ago we sat in this exact same spot, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, you know, the sky has not fallen completely, for sure. So these kids, I truly believe, will be able to come back and – uh, being 0-1 in conference is not the end of the world. Uh, it wasn't the plan walking in. 
but our kids were good this morning and I don't really formulate a plan when I get up in front of the kids today in the team meeting I don't write down a bunch of notes and I just speak from my heart to them and I believe we're going to be fine I believe in this crew they're going to work hard they're going to fight back and you know, we lost to a team that uh, is a good football team. You know, Northwestern, is, they're going to win a lot of games as they go through the year. I truly believe that. And they've really done a nice job of getting the ball to their playmakers on offense. Those the two transfer kids that came in, one from Rutgers and one from USC, I believe, those two kids kind of flip their offense upside down and gives them a core of, you know, four or five wide receivers are very talented kids that, that helps them move along. Um, so we'll have a, a message of positiveness and, as always, don't forget it, but uh, we have to move on to have an opportunity to beat Illinois. Brian. What are the challenges Illinois poses? And uh, without their starting quarterback, too, how do you go about scouting their quarterback position? Well, it was uh, you know the Nebraska game. The young man that will play against us played. And so we'll put a, a lot of stock into, uh, into that game. He's, he's played games. We'll go back and look. And he's finished some games. He's played some games in his past. So I think we've got enough film to get him evaluated. and see what kind of quarterback he is. The offense is very wide open. Uh, they throw the ball all over the place with a lot of different schemes. Uh, it's a, a coordinator that's done it for a long, long time and uh, been very effective at, at what he does. So it's going to be a, an interesting challenge for us. Again, they have a very, very talented tailback who we played against last year, and he has continued to get better and better and better as he's uh, gone through his career. So. Uh, they'll they'll pose a, a series of problems just like every offense does, um, and it'll be a it'll be a good matchup for us. The key is this week is for the Badgers to take care of the Badgers on offense, defense, and special teams. If we do that, we'll have a good opportunity, um, and I'm sure Illinois would say the exact same thing. Then they'll have a good opportunity if they take care of themselves. Jim, Gary, do you have any update on the status of of <clears throat> Trotter and Golden and Tyndall and? And also, Taiwan Deal, is he any closer to being back or any of the other guys that have been yeah. been out? <clears throat> Excuse me. Taiwan will be back out of practice, um, but he'll be involved in um, the scout team scenario right now. The plan is to redshirt him unless uh, well, we're going to redshirt him because nothing's going to happen. So there you go. We're good there. Um, the uh, Let's see. Devin is – questionable. We'll see exactly how he moves forward. Trotter should be fine. Tyndall should be fine. And did you mention somebody else I'm missing? Um, any other guys that want or hearing any of those? Not, not yet. No, nope. those guys are still getting closer. As the, as the days click by, they're getting closer to getting back. Um, Melvin's obviously played awesome the last few games. Yep. How good is he right now, and how much better do you think he can be by the end of the year? I think he's leading the country, right? So right now there's nobody better. Um, you know, he's leading the country. I, I'm biased, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm biased. Um, but he is an unbelievable uh, force out there on the football field. Anytime he catches it, he has the ability to, to go the distance. And um, exciting to watch him play. And, you know, it just – when you walk by that young man after the game, and the first thing he does is walk up to you and say, "Sorry, coach, are you kidding me?" I mean, that is that's a class individual. So, you know, uh, he's he's a great kid, and he deserves what he's getting in the run game. And um, hopefully, his accolades will follow him, and he gets everything he's wanted in football because he's a tremendous young man. But he is a a great player, and he'll have high expectations of playing at a high level again this week, and uh, help lead us to a victory. Coach, this is kind of two parts. One, you, you seem to put a lot of emphasis and stock in how players practice and how they perform in practice. Mm -hmm. Was there anything at all last week that led up to um, maybe them not performing as well as, as your expectations were? And then when things don't go quite as well, you've talked about motivation and, and reinforcing positive stuff, but as a coach, a parent, teacher, do you let your players know that if there's if there's an area of disappointment, you're you're honest and just tell them, you're better than this? Yeah, uh, first of all, um, you know, if, if, if we look back and say, okay, how are we going to handle the, the loss with the, with the kids? There's a lot of different ways to do it, but we're aggressive in our coaching. We always have been. We believe in being aggressive in our coaching, and we'll completely let them understand that when we need to get better, how we need to get better, and what our issues are. Um, we'll also take responsibility for coaches because I think if we do that, we're not who we say we are. And 
Um, we can't just sit back and, and hide from it. So I, I expect our coaches to coach young men um, tough, hold them accountable on and off the field like we always talk about, and uh, expect them to, to, you know, to continually move forward. So what was the first part of the question again? I blanked out on it here. Did you have a good week of practice? Oh, good week of practice, yes. Um, well, both offensively and defensively, we had what our coordinators told me, you know, our best week of practice. So um, maybe that's verbiage we should stay away from in the future. But uh, I thought the kids practiced very well and uh, came out and, and did good for my uh, mindset. They did also. And, um, you know, but good practice doesn't always guarantee a victory, that's for sure. Jeff. Gary, getting back to Melvin for a second, you may have partially addressed this. You know what his expectations are. You know some mm -hmm. things he talked about, why he came back this year. Is on your radar at all, in any way, if his frustration, frustration level with the lack of team success to this point affecting his performance, if he starts maybe try, try to do too much and step out of his comfort level? Do I worry about that? No. Um, I'm very comfortable with... Melvin being driven enough as a competitor to go out and compete every single week, regardless of the team's record and regardless of, quite frankly, what successes he had the week before, um, he's going to keep on going. Uh, but it does make me happy for him uh, that he's where he is today uh, versus where he was you know, after three games. Uh, I think it's great for him to be in the spot that he's in because that was his expectations is to – be a great running back. And he, again, we all know he doesn't sit there and say, I'm the best or I'm this or I'm that. That's not him. But he sees himself as a, as a very good football player and has high expectations of himself. And I think he feels he's in a better spot right now with his numbers personally than he was weeks ago. And there's a little bit of a selfish side to this game. That's good for Melvin to be there. And I like him. I like the fact that he's having that success. And Gary, since we're moving our way down the depth chart at quarterback, DJ Gillens is, is definitely going to redshirt just to. Yes. Yeah, DJ will absolutely redshirt. Anything else for Coach? Thanks, guys. Right. Thanks, Gary.